Hello everyone, and welcome back to Scary Interesting and to another collection of Horrible Fates. In this video, we're going to go over two more creepy cases that went unsolved for decades. In fact, the second one is still unsolved and is considered one of the most confusing and controversial cases in history. As always, viewer discretion is advised. In the late 17th century, copper mining was big business in Sweden and it produced more iron and copper than anywhere else in Europe. This is because the Swedish government was pumping vast resources into turning old, peasant-run operations into big enterprises run by the local nobility to fund Sweden's involvement in European wars and even a brief bit of colonial conquest. One reason Sweden was so rich in minerals is that 380 million years ago, a giant meteor slammed into the earth there. The crater is now known as the Siljan Ring, and the meteor left traces of lead, zinc, and copper that people have been extracting for over 6,000 years. One of the places for copper was an area called Falun, and there had been a mine there ever since the 8th century. The people of Falun tell the story of a time in the 800s when locals spotted a white goat with red fur. They thought that the only way a goat could look like that was if it had been eating something that changed its color, like copper, so they started to search for the source. At first, they fished lumps of copper ore out of the surrounding bog, but it didn't take long for them to transition to digging it from the hillsides. At first, they used hand tools to get it, locating an ore vein and falling it as far as possible, often with little more than a candle or hanging lamp to help them see and only enough root for one person to crawl through. That's one of the reasons early mining was done by individual peasants. By the time the 17th century came around, things had become a little more sophisticated. The money pumped in by the Swedish nobility meant that more extensive tunnels could be cut, often reinforced by timber. Rather than hand tools, miners used explosives and then dragged or out using horses or water wheel powered barrels and chains or conveyor belts. It was all still done by flame light, but not just candles and hand lamps. By then, passageways were lined with torches and fires were lit to illuminate the deeper tunnels. However, this also meant that fumes could fill the shafts and explosions could happen any time. They also regularly flooded as groundwater found its way into the newly cut caverns. So, to combat this, they built pumps to remove accumulated groundwater and dug ventilation shafts to circulate clean air around the mine using fans and bellows. It was still backbreaking, dangerous work, but the amount of ore people could mine and the money they could earn was far greater than before the nobility had gotten involved. At the edge of the Siljan Ring, about 30 miles from Falun, was the town of Boda. Surrounded by mines on all sides, the road from Falun and Boda was well maintained, and it had to be, given the amount of ore transported on it. Every day, an army of men would leave Boda and walk up the road toward the many mines. Some of these men were small, able to squeeze through the tightest tunnels and reach awkward parts of the seams. Other men were big and strong, able to move tons of ore every day. In 1676, Mats Ilsraelsen was one of those men. He'd started working in a smaller family mine, but then as his reputation grew, he'd gotten work at the better paid Falun mine. During this time, he had a good reputation, steady work, and some close colleagues from there and his old job. Some of these friends nicknamed him Fet Mats, meaning Fat Mats, but they weren't insulting him because he was overweight. It was because Mats was just a large guy, especially for the time. We don't know exactly how tall he was, but he was said to have towered above most other men with broad shoulders and thick, solid legs. After some time working at Falun, thanks to his stable financial position, he'd been able to propose to his beloved Margreta, and she accepted. Afterward, they had plans for marriage, family, and a good future, and all was going well until two weeks before the Good Friday of 1677. Sometime around April 2nd, Mats headed out to the mine as usual. That day, he would be the first person down in the mine. He'd been tasked with lighting the fires for the day that lit the tunnels. It was a dark and scary job, but not one that worried Mats. To get into the mine, normally miners were supposed to climb down the ladders, but for a big guy like Mats, that was too slow and too tiring. Instead, he liked to ride the barrels used to extract ore as they were lowered back down. After seeing his friend Menz for a moment at the top, Mats jumped onto the barrel train and set off into the darkness. This was the last time he was seen for a long time. From that day forward, Mats was just gone. Despite searches, he didn't seem to be anywhere in the mine, at least there wasn't any trace of him down there, but no one saw him leave either. Some people thought he might have run away because he didn't want to be married, but it was really anyone's guess for the next 42 years. On December 2nd, 1719, the miners began to expand the mine. They started to work in a flooded section supported by timber that was 160 meters or 525 feet underground. Miners knew that plenty of ore was beyond the flooding and they wanted to drain the water to reach it. 
Then, either by accident or design, they broke through the wall into an adjacent shaft, clearing 30 feet of collapsed stone and releasing hundreds of gallons of water. As it flowed away, they spotted a pair of legs, seemingly cut from a body below the knee. Then when they got closer, they found an open tobacco box with preserved tobacco inside. Then their candle lamps flickered on a right arm and then a head. They'd found a body seemingly intact apart from the severed limbs. Some reports have said that the body was petrified like stone, but according to the miners, the body didn't look or feel like flesh or stone. It was more like the whole body had been covered in a layer of animal horn, making it hard, but not as hard as rock. It was more like a slightly rotten tree. Strangely, the body must have been in the mine for years, but it looked like it had only been there since that morning. Whatever had coated it preserved it perfectly. Once they got the body out, they let it dry and it hardened even more. Afterward, they had to find out who it was and a full investigation began on December 10th. And sure enough, it didn't take long to identify the body. Whoever it was, he was big, much bigger than most people at the time. Mans, who was by then a veteran miner in his 60s, knew who it was before he even saw him. This had to be Fet Mats. He told an inquest about how he disappeared after dropping down into a barrel to light the fires four decades ago. Word of this then got around, and before long, Matt's widow, Margretta, was coming to identify the body. She said she remembered the day he left and just didn't come home, and her story lined up almost perfectly with Mans' account apart from the date. After he disappeared, she'd gone to church and lit candles for him that Easter, hoping he would return home soon. It's thought that Matt's must have fallen out of the barrel somehow and was then swept into the depths of the flooded mine where his body underwent a unique preservation process. Despite Margretta wanting his body for a burial, she never married him, so they kept Matt's from her and put him on display so he could be studied. Scientists then descended on the area and suggested that Matt's had become preserved because of vitriol, or what we know today as sulfuric acid, mixing with copper in the ore and water to become copper sulfate. This essentially embalmed him in the liquid which deposited minerals across his skin, keeping him perfectly preserved. Fet Matz stayed on display until 1749, when 72 years after his death, his body finally began to decompose. Afterward, he was buried in Falun. On November 29, 1970, Carl Halver Oss found himself walking in an area visited so infrequently that there was barely a hiking trail to follow. It was wild, steep, and rugged, and Carl couldn't stop wondering how much further he had to go. This area that Carl was walking is a place called Isdalin, which is only a few kilometers from Norway's second largest city, Bergen. Translated to English, Isdalin means the Ice Valley, but locals often call it Dutstelin, meaning the Death Valley. This is because there were only two reasons anyone would go there. The first was hiking, which was dangerous enough given the surroundings. But the second was to end things. Historically, and for reasons unknown, Isdalin was where the locals in the Middle Ages went when they simply couldn't take any more. Thankfully, that tradition petered off over the centuries, but every so often, a body would be found up there, and if the victim wasn't there to hike, there was really only one other possibility. As Carl walked through the area, he began to pick up traces of a smell in the air that got stronger as he scaled the hillside, which was a sure sign that he was getting close. To anyone outside Carl's profession, the odor might give the impression that someone was grilling meat just ahead, but Carl and the others he was with knew better. But even for them, they had no idea how strange things were about to get in the next few steps. After finishing a sideways shuffle down a slope, Carl finally saw the source of the smell. Lying face up in a cluster of rocks was a body so badly burned that Carl and his colleagues had no idea if it belonged to a man or a woman. Then, as he got closer, he saw that the body's arms were raised with its hands clenched into fists, which is a position called a boxer stance, which is common among deceased burn victims. In addition, the clothes were either removed or burned away, with the exception of a pair of boots on the person's feet. Surrounding the body as well were items scattered on the ground, but some officials think they look placed or arranged in a specific way. Also found at the scene were some burned pieces of ripped paper, a watch, jewelry, an empty bottle of liquor, an umbrella, a matchbox, a plastic passport holder, and prescription eczema cream, among many other items. Police expected to determine who this person was by checking the name on the prescription, but weirdly, all identifying information was scratched off. And the same was true of every piece of clothing at the scene. Tags with brand names and manufacturing information had been removed, and this weirdness extended even to a pair of plastic water bottles. When police flipped them over, the logos had been completely scratched off. But all of that would just be the beginning of the weirdness. After the body was removed and all the evidence had been collected, police left Eastlin without much to go on. A cursory examination of the scene did reveal that the body belonged to a woman, but other than that, they had almost nothing to go on. So until they determined her identity, they would call her the Eastl woman. 
Following the discovery, the investigation by the Bergen police went nowhere in the first 24 hours, and since the city had such a low crime rate, cases like this one were quite uncommon. At the crime scene a day earlier, police had actually turned down help from the National Criminal Investigation Services, which is an agency similar to the FBI in the US, but when police realized they were in over their heads, they took the NCIS up on their offer. Resources were then poured into the effort to identify the woman and find out what happened to her. Afterward, every available officer was sent out to talk to Bergen residents and business owners. And this effort paid off with a much needed discovery after three days of coming up empty. Two suitcases were discovered in an expired rental locker at a Bergen train station, and what was inside was consistent with what they found at the crime scene. The bags clearly belonged to the unknown woman, and although the start of the investigation was abnormally confusing, it seemed like it was about to be solved. In any other investigation, officers would examine each item in the bags one at a time, carefully ensuring no potential clues would be destroyed or contaminated. But because of how weird it had all been, instead, the bags were quickly searched as officials at the train station raced to be the ones to discover an item that had the woman's name on it. Inside the bags were common travel necessities like clothing, shoes, and makeup, but even some of the expected items only seemed to make things more confusing. Currency from Norway, Belgium, England, and Switzerland were found in one of the bags, and police discovered another 100 Deutschmarks inside the liner of the suitcase. Even more strangely, a variety of wigs and a pair of glasses without prescription lenses were found. There was also a pair of sunglasses with a partial fingerprint on one of the lenses, but unfortunately, forensics didn't find a match in any available database. Maybe the most strange, however, was a notepad filled with lines of neatly printed combinations of capital letters and numbers arranged like coded text. There was also a second tube of eczema cream, again, with all the personal information scratched off. In fact, every single article of clothing had its brand and manufacturing tags removed. Even the combs and brushes had their brand names and logos scratched out. Police then showed the clothes to employees at a few department stores, hoping someone might recognize anything as belonging to a specific brand or manufacturer, but nothing was identified. It was all very clearly deliberate, which only made things more confusing. Thankfully, despite the increasingly weird findings, there were at least a few new leads officers could follow. Experts in cryptography started analyzing the notebook to crack the coded message, while others followed up on the only item in either bag with any kind of untouched identifying information. It was a simple plastic shopping bag from a shoe store in Stavanger, Norway, which is 130 miles directly south of Bergen. Incredibly, when police interviewed the shop owner's son, he remembered selling a pair of boots to a woman who took an unusually long time to decide which ones to buy. The boots this woman bought were the same charred pair found on the body, confirming that the shop owner's son was the first person police found who had interacted with the woman. He was then able to provide investigators with their first detailed description of what the woman looked like. He said she was average height and had long brown hair, brown eyes, and a curvy figure. Those features alone are pretty generic, but one of the qualities he noticed was how the woman smelled. It took him a moment to place it when she was in the store, but he soon recognized it to be garlic. This might not seem like much, but in the 1970s and 80s, garlic actually wasn't that common in much of Europe outside Italy, meaning the scent stuck out more. So as ridiculous as this might sound, this opened a massive door for investigators. With a physical description and a unique identifier, police spread out and visited every Stavanger hotel. And incredibly, the moment they mentioned garlic to the staff at one hotel, they immediately knew who police were describing. A member of the hotel's cleaning staff also recalled seeing a woman fitting the description and wearing a pair of rubber boots. Investigators were then given her check-in paperwork, and they finally saw a name they were certain belonged to the Isda woman. Her name was apparently Fenella Lork. The paperwork also included her address, date of birth, and other information that could be used to figure out what was going on. But again, strangely, when investigators started to look into Fenella Lork, they quickly found that a person by that name didn't exist, and neither did the address on her check-in paperwork. Thankfully, right as this name led to a dead end, experts believed they had cracked the cipher in her notebook. The system she used wasn't all that sophisticated after all. Most of the entries followed a specific pattern. Number, letter, number, letter, letter. For example, one line read 20M23MO. The numbers in the first two letters from left to right translated to May 20th to 23rd. So those first four spaces were for dates. The last letter then denoted a location, so the O in that entry stood for Oslo. Then, after using that system on other lines of code, police believed that the notepad contained a record of her travel. If they were correct, she had been in Norway for several weeks, visiting several locations before she was found dead near Bergen. The code also indicated that she traveled to France, England, Switzerland, and Belgium, among other destinations before arriving in Norway. Police then started reaching out to the other hotels in Norway that the woman might have stayed in, but none of them had any record of a Fenella Lork. 
But again, when police described her, anyone who had crossed paths with her immediately knew who they were talking about. Then, using a copy of the Fenella Lork paperwork, they compared the handwriting to registration forms from the past few weeks. Sure enough, they found several visual matches, and analysis by handwriting experts would later confirm that the same person filled out each of the forms. However, the woman used a new name and address for each check-in. The only thing that was the same on each of them was that they were written in German and her country of origin was listed as Belgium. But otherwise, just like all of Fenella Lork's information, police determined the other names and addresses were fake. This again meant that the woman's true identity was still not known. The effort wasn't a total loss though. All the unique names she used at check-in told police that she must have had forged passports for each of them, at least seven. However, none were located at the scene or with the belongings, leading to another dead end. So next, police turned to the handwriting analysis, which helped narrow in on where the woman might have actually been from. Certain traits and characteristics of her handwriting indicated that she must have spent at least some of her formative years in France. If not there, then she must have been in French-speaking parts of Belgium or Switzerland. This is because, more than 50 years ago in France, the lowercase letter T would be crossed as part of the initial cursive writing flow. But after each word, some people would go back and put another horizontal stroke mark above the lowercase T. Since handwriting habits are developed early in life and difficult to fake later in life in a convincing way, the find significantly narrowed down the list of countries she was potentially from. Also, when the woman signed each of the forms, she connected the last letter of the surname with the first letter of the first name, which was also indicative of a French influence during her upbringing. Most interestingly, though, was that one of the forms had an uncommon German phrase written on it that had only ever been used by Germans at one time and in one place in all of history, which was the German occupation of Belgium during World War II. So because of all this, the way police saw it, the woman was probably from Belgium. In the grand scheme, however, although interesting, that information didn't really reveal all that much. So police again turned to interviews with hotel management and staff to uncover more about the woman's features and behaviors. And sure enough, a waitress who served her in a hotel dining room apparently found the woman so intriguing that she was caught staring at her a few times. The waitress described her as having an elegant sense of fashion that the waitress envied and an air of confidence in how she carried herself. Other witnesses noticed her for the same reasons, but some of what investigators learned was also just bizarre. Apparently, the woman frequently requested room changes and even did so three times at one of the hotels. Another witness reported that whenever she left her room, she'd pull a chair into the hallway and leave it there, only to bring it back into the room on her return. She also kept to herself for the most part, but was seen on a few occasions with several different men. Someone also reported that they overheard her having a loud conversation in German with an unknown man. And the same waitress, who couldn't take her eyes off the woman, reported that she had dinner one evening with two men from the German Navy. The waitress also said that, strangely, the three never interacted with one another at any point from the moment they walked in until the moment they walked out. So based on this information and the evidence they did have, investigators had a few theories they were looking into. The most popular among them was that the woman was a spy, given all the fake names and travel and other strange behavior. Around that time period, the US and Russia were embroiled in the Cold War and tensions had boiled over between two countries in the Middle East, so there was a lot of intelligence activity all over Europe. Missile tests were also being performed on the Norwegian coast starting late 1960s, which could have attracted intelligence agencies of other countries. And in fact, some of the women's travel dates and locations even lined up with the dates of some of these missile tests. For as much as the spy theory was covered though, there were a lot of big problems with it. Like for example, if an intelligence agent were writing and keeping cryptic notes, the code would have been much more complex than what was found in the woman's notepad. And as confident and elegant as she was, some witnesses also described her as a bit clumsy and confused. In addition, supposedly, spies often don't travel as much as they're portrayed, since the whole point is to blend into their assigned surroundings. Supposedly as well, intelligence agencies in most countries would give their agents one strong alias and one passport for it, not upwards of 10 like the woman had. In any case, after police interviewed as many people as they could, they had sketches made and released them to the public. To that point, police had kept most of the information about the case private. Any media coverage it received was collected independent of police's involvement, so these sketches indicated they were at a dead end. Then, with all the leads in their own country spent, the next logical step was for police to travel to the countries the woman visited before arriving in Norway. This is when the case took an unexpected turn. Weirdly, Norwegian intelligence authorities rejected the request to conduct investigations in other countries, and not long after, the NCIS pulled the plug on the case entirely. Oscar Hordness, who was the chief police in Bergen, talked to the press later that day, and by that time, just about everyone in the country believed she was a spy. However, when he was asked about the possibility, Oscar emphatically stated that any connection to espionage had already been ruled out. He also shot down the possibility of the woman being a victim of murder too, and strongly implied that everything pointed to it being self-inflicted. Then, not long after that, the Bergen police director also told the media it was self-inflicted without question. 
The problem with these statements was that they were made more than a month before the final autopsy and toxicology reports were in. And these two reports ended up being incredibly important. It showed that there were soot in her lungs and high carbon monoxide levels in her blood, meaning that the woman was alive when she was burned. A fresh bruise was also discovered on her neck, likely the result of a fall or blow of some kind, and traces of gasoline were found on her clothing, yet no container was found anywhere nearby. Near her body as well, police also found an empty bottle of sleeping pills. Pathologists then found she had ingested an amount that was lethal over a couple hours, but importantly, the amount that had actually entered her bloodstream wasn't enough to even knock her unconscious. Interestingly as well, some of the undigested ones were strange because of their color. Supposedly, bottles in Norway at the time contained white pills, but the ones in her stomach were pink, which were only available in England at the time. So to reiterate how weird the finding was, she had an amount that would have been lethal, but wasn't even enough to knock her unconscious when she died. But despite these confusing findings, the NCIS didn't reopen the investigation and maintained its position that it was self-inflicted. Meanwhile, internally, the Bergen police were almost unanimous that she was murdered. Many of them believed the Isdal woman was a murder victim and that higher authorities were purposely preventing her identification from being discovered. Oscar's son even told the media in later years that his father actually shared those beliefs. So when he made his original statement, he was either coerced into doing so or changed his mind about the evidence at a later time. Then, in early February of 1971, a Catholic funeral was held for the Isdal woman in Bergen, and the only attendees were the 16 detectives who worked the case. A photographer shot photos and created an album that is stored at the Bergen Police Headquarters to be given to her relatives if her identity is ever determined. Prior to her burial as well, tissue and blood samples were taken and stored away in case they could help answer questions in the future. The woman was even buried in a casket made of zinc to preserve her remains should she ever need to be dug up for further investigation. In the decades after her burial, a few tips would pop up here and there, and most notably, a Bergen resident contacted a newspaper in 2005 and said that he had seen the Isdal woman hiking near Isdalen five days before her body was found. He said she wasn't dressed appropriately for the weather or for the train, and that she was being trailed by two men who seemed angry. When word initially spread about the discovery of her body in 1970, the man knew it had to be the woman he saw. He contacted a friend who worked with the police department to report his sighting, but with everything going on with the case, his friend told him it was probably nothing. So, frustratingly, the tip was never recorded or investigated. In 2016, just after the 45th anniversary of the Isdal woman being found, a podcast series called Death in the Ice Valley was released and gained instant popularity. The result of a joint investigation between the NRK, which is Norway's state-owned news radio, and the BBC, the podcast sought to answer questions that haunted Norwegian investigators involved with the case. However, as with previous investigations, they were not able to identify the woman. As of early 2024, the identity of the Isla woman is still unknown. If you made it this far, thanks so much for watching. If you have a story suggestion, feel free to submit it to the form found in the description, and hopefully I will see you in the next one.